Let us now hear God's word in Ephesians chapter 1. All of the 23 verses of Ephesians 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him, in love having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after, or better, when ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. Wherefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come, and have put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the advantage of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. <coughs> Let us read together Lord's Day 21 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Lord's Day 21. It begins on page 104. Lord's Day 21. What believest thou concerning the Holy Catholic Church of Christ? That the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, gathers, defends, and preserves to himself, by his Spirit and Word, out of the whole human race, a church chosen to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, and that I am 
and forever shall remain a living member thereof. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, are in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. Secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. What believest thou concerning the forgiveness of sins? That God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, will no more remember my sins, neither my corrupt nature, against which I have to struggle all my life long, but will graciously impute to me the righteousness of Christ, that I may never be condemned before the tribunal of God. Beloved, Lord's Day 21 is one of my personal favorites, and it overflows with beautiful subjects. Here we have, in question and answer 54, the election of the church, the gathering of the church, the preservation of the church. We could treat one or two or three or four of the church's attributes, the traditional perfections ascribed to the body of Christ, the unity of the church, the holiness of the church, the catholicity or universality of the church, and the apostolicity of the church. We could meditate on the communion of saints, as in question and answer 55, the communion that the saints have, first of all, with Jesus Christ, and then the communion and fellowship which the saints have secondarily with one another. And besides all this, there's a lot of material in the forgiveness of sins in question and answer 56. So you will appreciate tonight, as always, but especially perhaps with this Lord's Day, we have to make choices. And we're going to consider the church's unity, that one particular attribute or perfection of the church, its oneness. And we're going to do that this evening from an, an especially appropriate biblical book because it has a lot on the church, including the unity of the church, the book of Ephesians. We'll look at more passages than that which we read, Ephesians 1, sections from some of the other chapters. So let's consider then the church's unity. We'll consider that in connection with God's one salvation, Christ's one bride, and one spiritual body. The church's unity in connection with God's one salvation, Christ's one bride, and one spiritual body. The church's unity fits with and even flows from God's one and only Trinitarian salvation. This is the subject of Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. We begin here with God the Father and our eternal and unconditional election. The church's unity goes all the way back to that. Especially two verses are relevant here. Verse 4 says that God blesses us according as he hath chosen. It's the Greek word from which we have our English elected. According as he hath chosen or elected us, the one church, in him, Christ, before the foundation of the world, so that we should be holy and without blame before him. And then verse 5, the key word here is predestinated. We already looked at chosen and elected in verse 4. It states that in love God predestinated us, 
That is, he determined our destiny pre or before the foundation of the world. In love, God predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. So that here, the one church is, as Jan Hus, the Czech pre-reformer, famously put it, the one church is the one company of the predestinate. And the church's unity rests upon and proceeds from her eternal election in Jesus Christ. And that, of course, the church's unity flowing from eternal election over against the eternal reprobation of others. Then we move to God the Son and his full and complete atonement. And here the key verse is verse 7. In whom, again referring to Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, which issues in, and its chief blessing is, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And the idea and link between verses 3 through 6 and now verse 7 is that we in Christ have redemption through his blood, that is, we, the elect, the predestinate. And here, the church, the one church, is the company, the one company of the redeemed. The church is the company of the elect. We think especially of the Father there. But the one church is also the one company of the redeemed. And here we think of the Son. Those for whom Jesus Christ shed his blood on the cross. And the church's unity rests therefore upon her particular redemption in Jesus Christ. And that's why really only the Reformed faith can confess the unity of the church because there's a unity intrinsic in the cross of Jesus and this of course stands over against the reprobate world this one church redeemed in Christ over against the reprobate world for which Jesus did not die and did not even pray as he tells us in John 17 verse 9 and then we move third to God the Spirit and his comforting and assuring sealing. The key verse here is verse 13. In whom, and again it's in Christ, in Christ you also trusted. The previous passage referred to the Jews that trusted in Jesus. And now verse 13, in whom ye also, ye Gentiles, also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, when ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. A couple of Sundays ago, we looked at the sealing of the Spirit. Then we carried that idea over to the Lord's Supper last Sunday morning, because the Lord's Supper is a sealing or an assuring ordinance or sacrament. Here we're bringing it up yet again, because the one church is the company of the sealed ones. The company of the sealed, the company of the predestinate, the company of the redeemed, and the one church is the single company of the sealed, those who belong to their faithful Savior. So at the church's unity rests upon her spiritual sealing in Christ over against the reprobate whom the Spirit does not seal or assure because they bear the mark or seal not of the Holy Spirit but of 666. There is one church and it stands very clearly over against the ungodly reprobate world and that makes the unity of the church especially clear and precious. So this, beloved, then, is the one Trinitarian salvation 
outlined superbly in Ephesians 1, verses 3 through 14. I just picked a few highlights to make the main point. The one Trinitarian salvation of Christ's one church. One salvation means one church. And the one church of God is of the Father, through the Son, and by the Holy Spirit. Just as the one salvation of the one church of God is of the Father in election, through the Son in redemption, and by the Holy Spirit in sealing. Let's go further in Ephesians 1. The church's unity fits with and flows from the power of God used to effect and bring to realization his Trinitarian salvation. Think now of the divine might that's used in the glorification of Jesus Christ personally. The divine might to raise him from the dead. That takes power. No human being has ever or will ever, despite all of the mechanisms that they're trying to bring in in the World Economic Forum and so on, no one has ever or will ever bring anyone back from the dead. Then there's the divine power that lifted Christ into heaven. And then his div the divine power that enthroned him as king, which involves not merely seating him upon a great white throne, but investing him with power to govern the entire universe. <clears throat> Paul's point is that this is precisely and exactly the same gracious omnipotence that is exercised in the salvation of each and every member of the one and only church of Jesus Christ. Verse 19 refers to, and, and listen for the words that just heap up and build up the picture, the exceeding greatness of his power to usward who believe, according to the working of his mighty power. And then the comparison the succeeding greatness of his power according to the working of his mighty power that saves us, which is the same power that he wrought in Christ when God raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places. The apostle's statement here is to the effect that it is the same almighty strength that effected the resurrection, the ascension, and the session of Jesus Christ, it's that same almighty strength that achieved and applied salvation to the one church and to each and every living member of that one church. So the unity of the church then is in accord with God's one Trinitarian salvation and God's one divine omnipotence the church, as we're going to see from a whole host of different angles to make this one point alone just here, the church is one and could only ever be one because of the unity of salvation and because of the unity of God's divine omnipotence. To go further and to move from Ephesians 1 into Ephesians 2, the church's unity fits with and flows from union with Christ. In his resurrection, ascension, and session at God's right hand. Now this sounds like the last point, but it isn't. The last point spoke about God's power in Christ's resurrection, ascension, and session. This point speaks about our union with Christ in his resurrection, ascension, and session at God's right hand. Here I'm referring to Ephesians 2, verses 3. 5 and 6. Verses 1 through 3, of course, refer to the total depravity of each and every member of the true church 
prior to our conversion so that we were just as bad and just as much in ourselves and by nature the children of wrath as everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, verse 5 says, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved. Here we are quickened together with Christ. This quickening is the gift of spiritual life. This is our spiritual resurrection in union with Jesus Christ. Verse 6 continues, And God hath raised us up together. And I take this raising to be a step beyond the resurrection. His raising us up in a spiritual ascension in Christ. And verse 6 continues, God hath made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And so we have here not only a spiritual resurrection in Christ, but a spiritual ascension in Christ and our spiritual session or sitting with him at God's right hand in Christ. Now verse 5, and for that matter verse 8, as well as verse 7, mentions God's grace. And God's grace, being the grace of God, is his infinite beauty or pleasantness or loveliness. And this is the basic idea of the Old Testament Hebrew word rendered grace and the New Testament Greek word for grace and it is even in our English word grace or graceful or gracious. If we say that so and so is a graceful dancer we're saying she's a lovely delightful dancer let's make it a modest sort of dance being Christians of course and if someone provides a gracious answer, you mean that that was a very sweet and attractive way to respond to possibly an obnoxious statement. But the English, as well as the Hebrew and the Greek, the latter two being definitive, carry the idea of beauty. Now notice the reference to grace here. Verse 5 says that we were dead in sins, and God quickened us together with Christ by grace he or see it. So there's a graciousness there, which means a sovereign mercy and pity, but which also carries the idea of beauty. We'll come back to that. Then verse 8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that, referring to the preceding clause, the grace, the salvation, and the faith, and that, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. And so God's grace, being beauty in himself, God's grace to us is his irresistible will to make us beautiful in Jesus Christ. Carry that idea of loveliness through. Verse 5, we were dead in sins. Death is ugly. Spiritual death is even uglier. Death in sins is corruption and putrefaction, obnoxious to God. Well, even when we were dead in sins, God quickened us together, gave us life, which is a wonderful thing, and gave us the life with Christ and the life of Christ. By grace ye are saved. God has made you a living person, spiritually, with the life of Christ, which is lovely. Verse 6 God raised us up together. That is, he lifted us up through our union with the ascended Christ. And now there's a heavenly spiritual beauty to us too. And then, verse 6 continues, he made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus through our union with the reigning Christ. And that's a very beautiful truth as well. Grace. To take dead, ugly sinners 
Unite them to Christ and give them life and heavenly bliss, pleasantness and sweetness and beauty. 4 verse 8 says, By grace are ye saved through faith. This faith that trusts in Christ, that unites us to Christ, that saves us in Christ, and that makes us beautiful in Jesus. So why then is the church one? And why could the church only ever be one? Well, because it is the recipient of God's one Trinitarian salvation. Chapter 1, verses 3 through 14. Which one Trinitarian salvation is applied to the church by God's one divine omnipotence. Verses 19 and 20 of the first chapter. Through the church's union to God's one and only Christ, especially in his glorification, which makes us beautiful. So it's all of grace. Chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And even this extremely brief explanation that hardly does justice to the passage, that says a little, skates on the text as it were, and then moves on quickly to the next point, even this brief explanation of the unity of the church from her one blessed salvation, the first point of this sermon, it indicates that the church's unity can never rest merely on such things as these. And this is how the deformation of the church results. When people begin to see the unity of the church in, form, in terms of only this or chiefly this, or mainly the other, the church's unity rests upon the things that I've just been explaining. It's not the church's unity, something like this. We have lots in common in our church because most of us have some of our recent ancestors buried out the back in the burial plot. Or there are many people in our church and they're of the same ethnic or economic group and we've got lots in common and that's why we're one and we're also a little bit religious and that helps or well we know that we're one because we walk under a door and above it there's a sign which gives the name of the church so we must be one that's that's the unity of the church we've got to be one because somewhere or other there's a membership rule and my name's on that roll, and your name's on that roll, and basically that's what our unity is. We've all signed up and are paid subscribing members of the same club. Or that it's merely this, that we actually profess to believe the same creeds. Now you should profess the same creeds, you shouldn't merely do that. But even that isn't the basis of the church's unity. It goes deeper than that, much deeper. The unity of the church rests upon the mystery of our one common salvation. A Trinitarian salvation in union with Jesus Christ and effected by nothing less than the one divine omnipotence. Ah, now we're talking about church unity. That, that's biblical. That's reformed teaching. That's what the unity of the church is. It's not, well, I'm a member of a band or a golf club, and then religiously, I'm a member of a church. And we're all sort of unity within these various groupings. Or I go to a school, and I'm a member of a political party, and then there's this churchy thing to I'm one with them. It's a lot more than that. The church's unity, beloved, is indicated in the Bible by its many revelatory names. Very deliberately, we sang Psalm 80, and in the first two verses, as I hope you noticed, the church is called a flock. That's singular. The church is one flock, not two flocks or more flocks, one flock. That's the unity of the church. In the other verses which we sang from the 80th Psalm, 
The church is called, here we're moving from animal imagery with a flock, to arboreal imagery and a vine. One vine. Not two vines or seven vines or 37 vines. One flock, one vine, because the church is and can only ever be one. Ephesians 2 emphasizes the unity of the church, especially from this perspective, that God makes believing Jews in Jesus Christ and believing Gentiles one in him. The church is the new humanity. And the new humanity that God is building is not a humanity with little nano technology things going through your bloodstream and eliminating cancerous cells and killing all this diseases that's in you. And it's not transforming parts of your body into robotics or incorporating your mind with artificial intelligence. The new humanity has already been begun and it is the church. Here is verse 15. Christ abolished, Ephesians 2, 15, Christ abolished in his flesh the enmity, related to the word enemy, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, which separated the Old Testament ordinances between Jews and Gentiles, for to make in himself of twain, Jews and Gentiles, one new man, that is, one new humanity, consisting of believing Jews and Gentiles, so making peace between Jews and Gentiles through the cross and by faith. So he makes it of two, Jews and Gentiles, through faith in himself, one new humanity. That's the unity of the church. The church also is God's one family of human beings. They're called, we are called, the household of God. And he doesn't have two households or eight households, just, just one. Verse 19, now therefore ye, you Ephesians, who are mostly Gentiles, ye are no more strangers and foreigners as Gentiles were in the Old Testament when God was centrally saving Jews. You're no longer, no longer strangers or foreigners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints or holy ones, and you are of the household of God both Jews and Gentiles, one household, one family of God. And the next three verses go on to explain that this new humanity is God's family and is God's temple. Verse 20, you are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together, groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. Jews and Gentiles in Jesus, one holy temple, in whom you also, you Gentiles, are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. The one church of God is pictured in imagery which always communicates the oneness. It's one flock. It's one vine. It's one new humanity. It's one family of God and one temple of God. And the church's unity is further revealed in Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33. In this familiar passage, the church is called Christ's wife, singular. That is, his bride his female spouse. And Jesus Christ no more has two wives than he has two churches. He doesn't have two wives at the same time. That would be adultery. And he doesn't have two wives with one being subsequent to another so that Israel was his wife in the Old Testament. They took a different, a different wife in the New Testament 
being the New Testament church. The unity of the church means that the people of God in Old Testament and New Testament, whether they're Jews or Gentiles, the true people of God are actually one in God's temple and family through Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit. In fact, this passage explains that so close is this union between the one Christ and his one church that these two are, in a certain important respect, actually one. But not one in another sense. They keep their individual personality. I'm referring, of course, to verse 31, which quotes Genesis 2, verse 24. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. And then you expected to say, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning human marriage. But it doesn't say that. It says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. They too become one flesh. And that is deeply mysterious indeed. This same passage explains what Jesus Christ does for his one church, here called his one bride and wife. He offers one sacrifice for her. Verse 25, he gave himself for her on the cross. He gives to her the gift of one sanctification. Verse 26, so that he would, quote, sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. And he grants to her her one glorification. Verse 27, so that he might present her to himself a glorious church. Sanctification, verse 26. Glorification in the new world, verse 27. A glorious church, not having any spot or even a tiny little wrinkle or any such thing, but that his church in her glorified state should be absolutely holy and totally without blemish. And here is the care of Jesus for his one church, that is his one bride and wife. He has one love for her. Verse 25. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church. And therefore he gave himself for her. And out of this one love for her, he cherishes and nourishes his one bride, the church. Verse 29. No man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord, the church. And the next few verses after Ephesians 5, 22 through 20, 33, teach us that the one church includes not only elect, redeemed, and sealed Jews and Gentiles, we saw that in the second half of chapter 2. But also, as these opening verses of chapter 6 teach, the one church includes children, even little children, as well as older kids, and fathers, one could also add mothers, servants, slaves, employees, masters, and employers. And I've just summarized the various parties who are addressed in Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 9. So if you're male or female, you don't say, well, I'm on the outside looking in. No, no, both are there. Well, I'm too old or I'm too young. No, it makes no difference. Or I haven't got much money. Or I'm nearly too rich to go to the church. No, these things are no bar. Faith in Jesus Christ is the entry. Let's move to our third and final point on the church's unity, treating this in connection with one spiritual body. And here we're going to look at three key portions of Ephesians 4, which I know is our scripture passage for this year's Federal Vision. 
And therefore, some of these things might have been said to some of you, but bear with me, it's none the worse for hearing it twice. Let's read Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. And in case you missed it, here we have seven uses of the word one. Nowhere else in the Bible do we have anything like this. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. That's some repetition. And they're all, of course, related. Related like this. There is one body, the church, the unity of the church. And here's this unity of the church further unfolded. There is one body which is animated or given life by one spirit, namely the Holy Spirit of our Lord Jesus Christ, who indwells the one church. And this one spirit unites all of the elect in due time to the one body, the church, by one baptism. This referring to the real spiritual inward baptism, which is, of course, in due time <coughs> signified and sealed by the ceremony and sacrament of water baptism. Now, being united as one body through one spirit by one baptism, we have, let's bring in the fourth and fifth ones, we have one faith. Objectively, the true church and each elect believer, according to the new man, has one subjective faith in his heart, put there by the Holy Spirit, which receives as truth the one objective faith which is taught in God's word, the Bible. And we not only have one faith, we have one hope, one inward longing for the great good that's coming in the future, as revealed in the Bible, the return of Jesus Christ to make all things new. He raises the dead, he judges the world, and he ushers in the new heavens and the new earth while casting the wicked into the everlasting lake of fire. And being united as one body through one spirit by one baptism, we serve one Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, and one God who is above all and through all and in you all. And this, beloved, is another way of presenting biblical church unity. This is what Jesus Christ was praying for in John 17, that they all might be one, even as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they may be one in us. So that they're one body, animated by one spirit, possessing one hope, serving one Lord, believing one faith, receiving one baptism, and the servants of one God and Father of all. The unity of the church as the company of the predestinate, the company of the redeemed, the company of the sealed, is not something that can be organized, created, and institutionalized by an apostate body like the World Council of Churches. All you have to do is explain what the Bible means with church by church unity, and then you look at this poor, mongrel, half-dead, bleeding and corrupt thing that the World Council of Churches tries to present as the Bride of Christ, and it's a filthy, decrepit whore, and you turn your head in disgust and say, you people haven't got a clue. You're only playing out. Here's question and answer 54. What believest thou concerning the, singular, Holy Catholic Church, singular, of Jesus Christ. Well, this is what I mean. That the Son of God, from the beginning to the end of the world, so from Adam and Eve after the fall, all the way to the last elect, who's effectually called prior to Christ's return, 
the Son of God from the beginning to the end of the world, he gathers, defends, and preserves to himself by his spirit and word out of the whole human race, Jew and Gentile, every nationality, kindred, tribe, and tongue, a church, singular, one church, chosen or elected to everlasting life, agreeing in true faith, that's unity, and that I am and forever shall remain a living member thereof. Because apart from the last clause or so, it's of no good to us. Confessing this church and then saying, well, I kind of hope I might be in it. And I'm going to do my best. I'm going to try hard. No, we believe one holy church, that there is this church. And by the grace of God, I'm in the body. For I believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What then about our calling regarding the church's unity? Because mostly it has been descriptive. We've been explaining what the oneness of the church is. But what does the Bible say we've got to do as regards the unity of the church? Well, we have the opening three verses of Ephesians 4. We do not create the unity of the church. We don't form it and make it. Instead, we maintain the already divinely created unity of the church. Verse 3 refers to our calling as those who are endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. The unity is already there. The unity has been divinely created. Now you have a calling to keep the unity. Verse 1, Paul exhorts thus i therefore the prisoner of the lord because he was in jail for the gospel at this point i beseech you i plead with you that ye walk worthy of the vocation or calling wherewith ye are called and the you and the ye that's plural the individual members in the church the church at ephesus church wherever it may be in the earth individual congregations the global church. What are we to do? Verse 3. Endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. How do you keep the unity that's created by the Holy Spirit in this peaceful bond? How do you do that? Verse 2. With all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. This passage is saying that we, individual Christian or several Christians, we keep the unity of the Spirit by possessing and reflecting a certain attitude in our relationship with other believers in the body, with all lowliness and meekness. So the attitude is lowliness, is humility, is gentle. And then, besides our attitude, it describes how we are to react to annoying, maybe really, really annoying things, but basically things that aren't that important, trifling things. How do we react? We have this attitude, the attitude of lowliness and meekness. And then someone does something that we don't like and it, it makes us want to scream or tear our hair out. Well, we react with long suffering. You suffer it, you put up with it, you don't really like it, and you do this long time, and you forbear, you bear with the person, and you do that out of love for God and for the church and for the individual. And it's clear the sorts of things we're talking about here are not massive sins that need to be dealt with by the way of Matthew 18. So that for the sake of God-given unity, and not desiring to make a big deal of every little thing, we just let some things go in the church, just as everybody does, and you better do it, or otherwise your house will be falling around you, as everybody does in their homes and with their children and in their marriage. Because charity, or Christian love, covers a multitude of sins, and that's what King Solomon said, and he was fairly wise. And the Apostle Peter, whom Jesus called a rock or a stone in the church. 
And this is something that I and we need to take seriously because after this exhortation, verses 1 through 3, Paul says, Now remember, there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and even in you all. But someone could say, and this is our closing section, beloved, someone could say, now hold on a minute. I like it that you've applied this, as the Bible does here. But even then, you've still only spoken, spoken about our calling to preserve the church's unity. Sort of to hold on to what we've got. Well, isn't there any way in which we have a calling with regard increasing the church's unity and growing in oneness? Doesn't the Bible deal with that? Because I kind of think it should. And I think somewhere or other it does. And you'd be right. Our God and Savior in Jesus Christ has this in hand too. Because after obtaining our redemption on the cross and rising from the dead on the third day, our Lord ascended into heaven. And verse 11 says that he, the ascended Christ, gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, three temporary, extraordinary teaching offices that have ended with the first century AD. And he also gave some pastors and teachers. Now what's the point in Christ giving ministers who shepherd the church by teaching biblical doctrine? And the answer is in verse 12, they have been given for the perfecting that is the equipping of the saints. So ministers and preaching and teaching equip the saints with the knowledge of the word of God. And this in turn is to enable the saints, verse 12 continues to do two things, the work of service, the saints serve the Lord and one another, and for the edifying or building up of the body of Jesus Christ, loving and witnessing and fellowshipping with one another. Verse 13 adds, till we all come in the unity of the faith, the oneness of the faith. So there's a growth, a growth in the knowledge of the faith and we all come more and more into the oneness and unity of it. So we more and more become one in the truth in the truth as it is in Jesus. And that's a very revolutionary thing. The idea that churches should be busy teaching anybody is amazing. Never heard, I haven't learned a single thing in church. Some people said, in 20 years, 20 years. I no longer go, by the way. Yeah, you, that's understandable. And then the idea the church should actually grow in truth and the members should become more united. The mind boggles. I never heard of a thing like that. Seriously, that's where many of the churches are at today. It's an absolute disgrace. This passage says that ministers are given till we all come in the unity of the faith, the one body of truth taught in the Bible, which is not just some objective list of words and doctrines. It is the knowledge of the Son of God and believing and knowing these words which are spirit and they are life. These are the words of Christ. We know Jesus Christ the Son of God himself, personally. And then to skip forward to verse 16, which emphasizes unity again, and refers to the calling of believers. We're all going to speak the truth to one another, speak the truth in and out of love. That way we grow up into Jesus Christ. Verse 16 continues, from whom the whole body, singular, there's one body, one church, in case you've missed it, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working and the measure of every part, this body, the church, makes increase of the body unto the edifying or building of itself up in love. What do you understand by the communion of saints? First, says the catechism, that all and everyone who believes, being members of Christ, 
are in common partakers of him and of all his riches and gifts. We've seen that in verses 11 through 16 and elsewhere. And secondly, the communion of the saints means this too, secondly, that everyone must know it to be his duty readily and cheerfully to employ his gifts for the advantage and salvation of other members. So that's what I'm supposed to do in the church. I'm not sure I've ever thought of that before. I'm supposed to use my gifts. This is my duty, readily and cheerfully to employ my gifts for the advantage and salvation of the other members in the church. It never occurred to me. Whew, I don't think I'm really consciously and gladly fulfilling my role. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. I thought I was just to come to church and listen to a sermon and stand up when everybody else stand up and sing when everybody else is singing. But I'm supposed to be doing this too. <coughs> this bit about speaking the truth and love, building one another up, eh, there's one or two people, maybe three or four, maybe more. I kind of struggle with them. A wee bit of jealousy, a wee bit of strife, a wee bit of hatred. How long? And the Catechism speaks to this too, and it says that there is pardon. Pardon in the blood of Jesus Christ for all who repent and believe in him for the remission of sins, and this sin too, sin against the unity of the body. What believest thou concerning the forgiveness of sins? This is what I believe. Those who talk about the Holy Catholic Church in the communion of the saints, and that's very, very high, and I know I don't live that way in the church, or anywhere else for that matter, the way I should. I believe that God, for the sake of Christ's satisfaction, that he will no more remember my sins, and he won't remember my corrupt nature, but he will graciously impute to me Christ's righteousness, so that I shall never be condemned before the divine tribunal. And then forgiven, laying hold in this pardon, the Christian loves God and the brother. He keeps the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, believing there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. And then he seeks, and by the grace of God, he does grow in unity in the body of Jesus Christ, which is his one and only church. Amen. Our Father in heaven, help us to understand the deep and mysterious truth regarding thy church and for us to live the way we must, to function in the body and to enjoy the communion of the saints and the blessedness of being part of the mystical body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.